Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. This is Yvonne from Ginger Chick Rehab. Have I got an exciting video for you today. I could not help myself. I ran across a TikTok where somebody was doing some farmhouse animal molds and I'm like, okay, and onto the interweb I went searching and it was redesigned molds. So I was able to order those. I'll link them down in the description box. And then it's funny because usually you have the crockery or the vessels or the containers or what have you already, but I actually had the molds, so I had to go looking for them. So, hey, so this is what today's video is all about. How many of you watching do you run across an Instagram, a TikTok, just a photo, and you're like, I want that. How did they make that? So this is what happened to me on TikTok. I saw somebody have what these embellishments, these molds that they added to, and so my search was on to find them. Lucky for you all, they are down in my description box, so you will not have to go searching. But now I had to search for some vessels, some canisters, some of these ceramic pitchers to be able to put them on. Now to get these cleaned up, I'm just going to do hot water and a Dawn dish soap right in the sink. This will get any of anything that is grease, any buildup, any dust, any anything that prevent my paint from sticking nice and clean and also help me be able to remove the tags get my texture paint to stick to these I need to spray them with something and my go-to is always the rust-oleum paint and primer in one in the flat black that way if when I go to do any distress in or any of the paint accidentally rubs off it's the black that you see so I'm going to get these all newly spray painted up and if you noticed I tape off the, so I don't get any spray in the inside I just use some two inch masking tape from the Dollar General store that way when I'm thrifting these pieces, I'm looking for something that's going to coordinate with the paint colors that I like to paint. So I want to keep those food safe or whatever have you by not touching the inside of these. And then the nice thing about using a black spray paint is you know when it's dry, it is not shiny anymore. And especially with this little watering can, it actually had holes that you could actually water out of it. So what I did is stuff a grocery sack in the inside of it. So that way the spray didn't come through those holes. Now I need to seal my black in. I'm going back to my polycrylic in the matte finish. I've been having a little bit of problem with the Rust-Oleum Clear Coat. Um, crinkling on my items that I have been spraying for an in-between coat especially when it's a non-wood item so I'm going to go back to my polycrylic and see what's going on with that rust-oleum because I get a lot of questions in between the rust-oleum clear coat or the polycrylic you just really just need a clear coat something to seal them in and I prefer it not to crinkle but I don't know why that does that if it's dry time, if it's not enough dry time, I don't know. If it's, I can't tell you why it does that because it is so random when it does it. So while those are setting off to the side and drying, I'm going to be starting to make my mold. So I'm just going to be laying some press and seal down or some saran wrap, something that can help you lift your mold up when you're done making it. So, you know, I'm kind of a learn as you go. So this is probably, I'm going to say my third, fourth, maybe attempt of making these molds. So I'm getting a little bit better with time. So I've just got some cornstarch here and then all I'm doing is dusting some powder and something to help release that air dry clay that I'll be using out of the mold. So just a little dusting before I probably put too much on, but I'm, I'm getting the hang of this, guys. I'm just going to guesstimate on how much of the clay I need, and I already had an open container. I was just showing you that for to show you what it was. So all I'm doing here is just mixing it, warming up, getting it more pliable to be able to put into the mold. So yeah, but I had to test it out and see how that printed out. You, I couldn't help myself, so now I need a little bit more, and then I'm going to push it in. Now these are redesigned by Prima Molds. They don't have that cut edge like the IOD molds do. So I'm like, how am I going to do this to scrape it off? So actually, uh, do you all have any of those Pamper Chef brown scrapers laying around? I actually have a couple in our workshop that I've used for other things. So I thought, you know what, this might push it down and make it so I can cut off the excess. And it actually is working out quite nice. 
Now it's the rolling. I'm hoping that it doesn't split in half, but we're going to glue it together anyway if it does. But anyway, oh my gosh, it rolled out so nice. And I might go back and take a little X-Acto knife if I have any extra that I don't want before it is drying. But oh, I love that farmhouse. So next up is the cow. Oh, I'm remembering to dust it. It's all these steps you have to remember. And so, yep, now I'm remembering to dust it on, making sure I get that cornstarch, especially in those little bitty feet area. And a guesstimate on how much of the clay I need, making it into a ball, making it warm it up, making it so that it's more pliable for it to be squished down. And then I do go back in, I need to do littler pieces for the heads, the tail, and the feet, but I can push them and mold them kind of together while it's already in the mold. Now I'm going to go in again and I'm going to try that scraping tool. I'm going to hold down that clay so it doesn't lift it up while I'm scraping, kind of working it from the middle out, making sure that I am, I am flat pushing it in, making sure that it's really packed in there and then just gingerly working around because it does the clay kind of wants to lift as I'm pulling off the scraping tool but I don't know you know you just work as you go and I do like how it is definitely helping cut it off and it's definitely helping me flatten it out and now that I've got it where I think I want it to be it's time to try to release it one of us hooves broke off, but I'm not going to worry about that. One, I'm going to be gluing it together. The clay is still wet. It's not dried. I can kind of squish it together. So, And then I'm just going to go back and trim off any excess that I didn't get. So now I knew that I wanted uh, bigger pieces, and you'll see why. <laughs> see how big this cow is on this cookie jar container i'm like oh yes i definitely when i was thrifting i needed to look for good size pieces but oh don't you just love that already I had a lot of viewers respond that they use this tight bond quick glue to glue their molds down onto their pieces so i'm like okay i can do that so trying to figure out how to flip them and not break them and get the glue on there. Well, you know, you just kind of wing it as you go. So I didn't know how much to use and I probably actually used way too much. And I was trying to go so gingerly as not to break the piece, but trying to get it nice and spread out. And we all know how much fun it is to put it, put anything onto a round object. So here I am just trying to, because I always have to flip it upside down for you all to see when I am filming. So trying to make sure from that upside down area that my aerial view of it all that I am level. So, yep, I realized with this cow, I probably did use way too much glue. Well, if a little's glue, a lot's better sometimes, right? No, because then you have to clean off the excess. And then the cow kind of kept slipping down a little bit. So I needed, I'm like, oh, I did. Always have a wet wipe handy so you can wipe off any excess. And then I needed to put a towel underneath the front part because the way that this was made, he, the cow just kept sliding right down it. So, oh, sometimes the struggles are real. So to keep my mold in place, I just used some of that press and seal to keep it down. Now, I will share with you that I did attempt to make some of these molds out of hot glue, but I will share with you later on why that did not work for me. So for my next canister, I did another one of the farmhouses and I'm going in and I'm doing one of these roosters. Now this rooster is not very deep and I'm a little bit worried about trying to get all the feathers, but hey, they know what they're doing and maybe I don't so much, but definitely remembering to dust it with the cornstarch. Now there's definitely a lot more area to try to push in, making sure that I get all those feathers from the tail and his comb and his little waddle there, along with his little, his little feet. So there's a lot of detail in this. So I wanna make sure that I'm pushing down and getting all that detail to show through on this mold. And then I got a little bit of cleanup to do. 
So now I do want to embellish this a little bit with some of these wreaths. So I'm going to go in and try to do these. These are a little bit deeper of molds. So the same exact thing, just working that clay in there, guesstimating how much I need, and then using that little Pamper Chef scraper to cut off the excess. Okay, so now I'm gonna have a different game plan for the glue. I'm gonna put it on a plate and see if I can control it a little bit better without putting it on my finger using this tool that spreads paint, um, glue around for you. That way, yeah, well, let's see how I do with this one. Now that definitely helped me control not getting too much glue on the mold this time. Now it's funny, once you go back and you finish a project and you're editing, and I was trying to figure out what was wrong with these little wreaths. And what the problem was is that I did not, they also, another downfall of filming upside down, I should have flipped that over for me to take a peek at it. And I should have known since my, my son showed chickens at fair that my rooster was not set straight. That was what my problem was. But you know what? It was already dried before I realized it. And yes, I could not help myself. I had to go back to my old faithful of the IOD sunflower molds. Oh my gosh. Anyone that I have put the sunflower on in my booth is gone. So I'm constantly still looking for things since we're still in the fall season. And I, I can get another month out of it at least. It, at least through November, Thanksgiving maybe. But I could not help myself. This is my absolute favorite. So I could not help but do another one of these on one of these container and on these pictures especially. Now this is a this is a big mold. So this takes a lot of the air dry clay. So you definitely want to make sure you have plenty on hand to fill this mold. That's why I really wanted the hot glue to work out. But still, I'll share at the end why the hot glue didn't work out for me. IOD molds have these wonderful cut edges, they call them, that stick. They're not completely flat. And that definitely helps really make that detailed area. So I went through that with that scraping tool, leveled off what extra glue, uh, the air dry clay that I had, and now I'm just making sure that I'm going through and getting all those petals cleaned up. I got it all glued up. I'm like, well, I'm just going to slap it down and I can adjust it as it goes. But I really didn't even have to adjust it. So the same thing that press and seal is holding it just like a clamp. So that's keeping it in place, giving it time to set and not slip and dry. Now for the last container, it is a taller container. So I'm like, you know, I love the sunflower, but come on, Yvonne, step outside your box, do something a little bit different. Okay, well, I'm doing the half sunflower with a stem and a petal. So that's stepping outside my box. So I have um, done the IOD transfers, and I thought that was absolutely gorgeous. So I knew this one would be no different. I'm doing my staging I realized that I did not need that bigger leaf that nice small simple leaf the smaller one was plenty oh my gosh as soon as I put this on this oh my gosh I I was already in love okay here's now why I will share that the hot glue did not work out the hot glue would not stay down without taking off the I had to use the press and seal to keep it down, but the press and seal also makes a very tight seal. So it was not allowing my glue to dry, which I found that too true on the air dry clay. First, I thought it was my 
hot glue, but it wasn't. It was the press and seal works too well. So then two days later, I kid you not, two days later, it took me to get my molds to dry after releasing enough of the press and seal for the glue actually to dry underneath the molds. So I probably could have used the hot glue if I would have known that, but I don't think it would have stayed down and formed at all like the air dry. But I just wanted to share that with you that, oh, well, two days later, I finally realized why my glue wasn't drying. So now I can finally move on to getting these painted. And to paint these, I'm using the mineral Waverly chalk paint and some baking soda. And what's this? what this is doing is it's giving the paint a texture. Not so much for the paint to stick on better, but it is going to be giving the paint texture. I get that question, so I always feel like I need to touch on that. So yes, it's a 50-50 ratio. And then you just mix it until your baking soda is totally mixed in. So remember what I said at the beginning, I don't touch the inside of my containers. I try to find a color that matches what I'm going to be painting the outside of it. And then I can clean up that outer edge as I'm painting. And I actually bought this paintbrush after making, if you saw my Ikea trip and our anniversary weekend, I ran into a store that had a paintbrush similar, but they wanted $40. And I just, I can't reason $40 for a paintbrush. I am not a reseller. I'm just somebody making YouTube videos trying to sell my wares at a antique mall. So I did stumble across this brush when I was looking on Amazon for $9.99. And I have to say, it's a nice brush. It's those soft bristles, bristles. And I'm sorry for anybody that sells those brushes, but I have to do things myself cost efficient. So I will link it down on my Amazon if you want to try it out yourself. But for right now, I'm just getting the paint on. So it's helping me, it's grabbing enough paint, it's making the paint nice and smooth. I tried to work in one direction. It's getting in those molds areas where I needed to be. So and now I just tried to work in one direction. I want it to make like a, a pottery looking piece. So you just do which direction or slap it on however you like it. I just like to work around the vessel. Then after I get my paint applied, I always go back through and I try to smooth anything out. I don't know, do you all notice that because of the baking soda mix mixture that sometimes the paint puffs up? Does that make sense? It puffs up. So I always go back through and I wipe off any excess that might be puff puffy. And yes, I do have my piece on a turntable. That way when I go back around, I can make sure that I, it's just helping me spin. It's that work smarter, not harder kind of thing. And I'm sure anybody that's regular to my channel knows that I always say a piece kind of tells you how it wants to be painted. So like this picture has those lines, those lines that are sharp edges kind of telling me like, hey, why don't you leave this top area black just for a little bit of visual interest. And I'm going to go ahead and do around the pouring spout and the handle also. That will just tie everything, everything kind of together. After going with that smaller brush for my details, then I can go in with the bigger brush and really get that paint in there. And I really want to make sure that all my little seams and that that's all filled in. I can go back and detail if there's any drips and runs, but I definitely want to make sure that I get my paint on there. And surprisingly, yes, this 
brush's bristles are soft enough that I can go right up that spout. But may be too thick enough to go underneath the handle, so I just switch over to the fan brush. I like that for detailing texture paint anyway. On this picture, I knew that I was covering up with the tape that you would see that blue area, but I wasn't worried because I did not want to spray the inside of it. So I'm okay with going back, taking the time to cover that up, just painting it by hand. I go through and do the tops of it anyway with my second coat, but since this is a little bit thicker, more of a crockery um, container, I'm going in with a little bit more of that texture paint first. Now after I get all four pieces done and I've let them set, I don't walk away and let them dry. I'm constantly keeping an eye out so when I'm putting that paint on, I know that I'm really trying to fill in any of the crevices. So I want to make sure that I'm keeping an eye out for the first 10 or 15 minutes or so, making sure that there's no drips and runs that I can blend them in while the paint is still fairly wet. Now after that is dried, I'm going in with my second coat. And for my second coat, I don't mix up any more of the texture paint. I just use what texture paint is left. And then I mix up more of the regular paint in with it. I don't need it to be any more textured, I, but I don't want to throw paint away also. So I just mix it up and then I like to go in with a fan brush. I don't want any more texture. I think these have plenty of texture to them. And the fan brush is just going to leave that nice smooth, smoothest that I am looking for. The texture gives it that pottery type of look. And then I'm a touch and feel kind of person, so I like it to be a smooth. So the first coat is to add texture and then the second coat is to make sure that it has full coverage. So still as I'm adding that second coat and even with I like the fan brush it's giving that nice smoothness like I said but then also I'm making sure that I stay in the same direction even if I have to go in a different direction to get it applied on I still try to smooth it out. So when it comes to these pieces unlike painting a piece of furniture where you can sand some of your brush marks off you're not really sanding that all the way down because you could probably just sand it right off these. It's not sealed in yet so just working in that same direction if you're looking if that's the look that you're going for like I am. After I got my two coats of paint on and now that that's dry, I go back and do my details. So on the bottom of the pieces, I usually leave them the black that they were not to waste paint. But like I always say, there's always that line, that line of demarcation, that line that tells me where to stop painting. So now I'm going to go back in and I'm just going to crisp up that line make the whole piece look as good as the rest of the piece. So yep, your bottoms and especially your top matter. On this little watering can, it was just kind of one of those awkward pieces. You couldn't really flip it upside down to paint it very well, but that's okay. I left it that natural. That natural matches what's inside of it, but I still need to crisp up and clean up that line. After that, all the paint is dry, I go back in and I'm just, there's not a ton of texture, but I can feel some roughness to it. So I just take a sanding sponge and just gingerly, just ever so lightly, take any of that over textured off. You don't want to press down hard or you'll be showing some of that black. So as we're getting down to the nitty gritty of finishing these up, Oh, here we go. These, this is just really going to make these molds pop. So I'm using a mixture. I'm going with the Waverly Antiquing Wax and the Waverly 
white wax. And so what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be adding some age. The antiquing wax is going to definitely pop the details of the molds out and then it's going to add a little bit of aging and then the white wax is going to blend everything in together. When it comes to this technique, you just do what works for you if you want to try this at home. For me, I've done a few of these now and I'm kind of getting to where what's visual to my eye. So I'm going to go in with that antiquing wax on my edges first. And then as I, as you see, I'm rubbing it, I'm rubbing it in the white wax, taking a little bit more, just blending it in an upward fashion. Now, if you want a little bit more control later on, I do show how you just go ahead and just white wax the whole entire piece first and then go in with your antiquing wax and it doesn't dry automatically and you can always take it off with the white wax or a clear wax. So don't get like, oh, I don't like what that looks like. It, yeah, sometimes I didn't like what it looks like. And I'm like, oh, take that off and start over. And then when it comes to adding the, um, the brown, the antiquing wax on, I make sure that I wipe off a lot of that on an excess an extra drop cloth piece or the side of the bowl so I only have minimal on. But my main focus is to look like this is a pottery piece. I want to pop out those details so I'm just choosing where to put the brown wax and how to rub it down that it just doesn't look like I outlined the piece that it slightly fades. <laughs> Now, the one thing I do suggest when you're doing the white wax that you make sure as you're putting the groupings on, you know how you're doing section by section, you just really make sure that you rub and blend it on. If not, you might get a line of demarcation of where you've added it to. So just take a little bit of time, make sure that you get that all blended in together. fun of this project is you just add and add away if you want the dark brown to show up you don't want it to be as blended as I'm blending you just do what's visually pleasing to your eye now I will say that sometimes because the chalk paint is not sealed in with anything and we do a lot of rub in here guys that sometimes yes you do go down and you do see some of the black so if you don't like that you can always just go back in with your paint color and cover it up i don't mind it at all i think it gives a little bit of a visual to it myself but that's why i choose that black color underneath that you definitely want a, a color that you're going to be happy to see in case you go through it so for my chicken, I'm just going to go ahead and do my molding first with the antiquing wax, get that blended in, and then go through the entire piece with the white wax, and then work on my edging with my antiquing wax next. And sometimes just to get into those little crevices, that little detail area, I do have to go back in with a paintbrush and just make sure that I'm getting it all in those spaces and all blended. And then if you want to add a little bit more brown in it and not have that be so clear, just go back in, use that dry antiquing wax brush and just add some more details in that way. Now, as I'm working on getting the white wax on this piece, I get right up to that flower and I'm just taking that brush and going right into those petals to begin with. And now I'm just taking that dry brush with the antiquing wax and just letting it hit those detailed areas of the sunflower. And oh, you can definitely really see it popping now. So 
the, for this piece, I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to, I already got the white wax on. Now I'm adding every area where I'm going to have some of the antiquing wax. I just, I don't want to, I just want to share with you not to stress because you can always get it off or add more back on. So I'm just going to go in all those areas that I want to have the antiquing wax. I want to show off some aging too. Go ahead and do that first before blending it all together. And then there's really no worries if I get any of the wax on the black that I don't want it. It's sealed in, so all I do is take a wet wipe and remove it. So I did the exact same process with this picture also. I put it on the white wax first and then did all my antiquing wax. And now I'm just going in after I blended it all in with white wax again and then just touching up those petals a little bit more, making so it's just not as brown. Like I said, it's just a whole bunch of little detail. I definitely feel like happy little flowers, happy little trees of Bob Ross here. And then after I get them how I want them, I let them dry for a few hours so they're dry to the touch or even overnight. And then I seal it in using some polycrylic something to seal that all in together. And I do like to do two coats, especially since I believe that these might be used in a kitchen or just for decor pieces, but just to be safe. So what did you think? Oh my gosh, I absolutely loved the redesign by Premium Mold. I, oh, I, yeah, I have everything to say about that farmhouse sign. And yes, I wish I would have put my rooster the right way, but you know, life lesson learned. It was already glued down and maybe, maybe somebody won't notice, but yeah, <laughs> anyway, it's, it's perfectly fine. If we can't learn from our mistakes, so I learn, I make mistakes every day and I just like, oh, okay, next time I'll tweak that a little bit differently. So I hope you enjoyed today's video and let me know, is this something you would try yourself or do you, I, I know a lot of you already do all these and have, have you got your hands on these molds? Oh my goodness. And there's my faithful sunflower that I just absolutely love. So thanks for watching today's video guys. And if I have inspired you in any way, give me a quick comment and a like for this video so to let YouTube know that you like this kind of content. And if you're part of our YouTube family, thank you so much. And if you're new and checking out our content for the first time and you liked what you saw, please hit that subscription button along with the notification bell and you'll see what I'm up to next time. Bye guys.